O Holy One, speak to us now and touch us through your word for us this day. And O oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by asking all of you a question. And that is, how many of you have a green thumb? Many of you? Yes. <laughs> I see many raised hands. I think we do have some avid gardeners and farmers among us in our congregation. During the past two years, since I have been here with all of you at First Church, I have learned that indeed several of you are seasoned gardeners and that many of you just enjoy being outdoors, doing yard work and planting flowers and getting your hands dirty in the soil. It feels good, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Even therapeutic at times. Would you agree? Yes. Head nodding. <laughs> In fact, many of you, First Church members and friends, regularly volunteer your precious time to be here at <coughs> church, to trim the shrubs back and to pull the weeds and to plant flowers on our grounds. Now, I don't know if this may come as a bit of a surprise to you, but I am not much of a gardener. And, and for several years, our backyard at home was not even suitable for a garden because it truly was our kids' playground and athletic field. It was where our children first learned how to play soccer and kickball and baseball and football and frisbee. It was where the neighborhood kids and friends would play tag or play on our swing set. Our backyard was where our kids used their imaginations to create their own games and competitions. One year, all the kids planned a backyard soccer World Cup tournament, and they each represented a different country. It was so much fun. And it was there in our backyard where our kids laughed and cried at times as they learned how to work out their differences and conflicts. Well, our family, as you may know, is now in a very different stage of life. Our older three children are now young adults and have left the nest, so to speak, for the most part. <laughs> and about a year ago, our youngest two, who many of you know, Henry and Malcolm, helped us to finally disassemble that old swing set that no one used anymore. And so to mark that significant transition in the life of our family, Shane and I decided that it was time for something new. And so we finally planted a garden. But we weren't exactly overconfident about our gardening skills. And so we started small with a three by four foot raised garden box. And guess what was the first thing to grow in our new garden last year? Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> bunnies. <laughs> yes, bunnies. 
a mama rabbit, apparently thought that our garden box looked like a safe and snug and cozy place to give birth to her four bunnies. And she was absolutely right. <laughs> and our gar garden box remained as their home until the babies were all big and strong enough and ready to go out into the world on their own. This year, just recently, Shane planted some tomato plants and strawberries in our garden box. And already, we are witnessing the gradual transformation, the flowering and the budding of both plants. It is such an exciting and encouraging and hopeful time to watch our plants develop and grow and hopefully thrive. As many of you know, gardening is certainly a very intentional and patient and disciplined and developmental process that simply cannot be rushed. But we are hopeful and eager to see this ripening and blooming process through because we are anticipating that the sweetness and the healthy goodness of our new plants will be well worth the wait. In our Gospel reading this morning from Mark chapter 4, Jesus offers us not one, but two gardening parables to help us understand something about the nature and the attributes of the kingdom of God. And whether we are botanists or master gardeners or beginners, gardening is literally a down-to-earth spiritual metaphor that is practical and relatable. And so, here in our text for today, we are given this timeless metaphor, one that has held deep spiritual truth and meaning throughout the ages and for us this day. In the first parable in our reading for this morning, verses 26 to 29 of chapter 4, Jesus stresses that even though the farmer is the one who planted the seeds in the ground, he actually has little to do with its growing or flourishing. Jesus explains that the earth produces of itself first the stalk and then the head and then the full grain in the head. The farmer may have scattered the seeds and later harvested the plant, but it was during that in-between time, that transitional time, that the growth and the flourishing actually happened. And then, if that's not clear enough, Jesus offered his followers a second lesson, the well-known parable about the mustard seed. And he emphasizes that the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, and yet when it is planted in the ground, in fertilized ground, it becomes the greatest of all shrubs, with branches so large that the birds are able to make their nests in its shade. During the past couple of weeks, as I have been reflecting on our text from Mark for this morning, I have been reminded of two things. First of all, gardening is indeed a spiritual and patient 
process. And secondly, growth and maturation cannot be rushed. Now, I realize that this sounds rather basic and obvious when it comes to plant life, right? But in the context of our everyday lives and in our life together as First Church, that's not always easy to practice. In fact, I wonder if many among us may be naturally impatient or may be socialized that way. I know that I am. <laughs> if there is a need, we want an immediate response. If there is a problem, we want a solution. We want to fix it as soon as possible. If there is some level of anxiety in our lives, we seek comfort and calm and control and long for peace. And yet Jesus reminds us through his gardening parables that we are often called to wait and be patient because maturation and healthy and meaningful growth cannot be rushed. However, in our reading for today, I don't hear Jesus suggesting to his followers that they are to become passive until the time of harvesting. Rather, I believe that Jesus is teaching his disciples then and all of us today to be patient and prayerful and discerning and faithful and hopeful in times of waiting and transition, and in times of restlessness and anxiety. And in that way, waiting becomes intentional, and waiting becomes active, and waiting can become life-giving. Similar to the time from planting to harvesting, we too are called to wait at different times in our lives. And so in that way, waiting indeed is a spiritual practice. And so I ask all of you, when in your lives has it been difficult for you to wait. Perhaps you know what it is like to have waited several days for your doctor's office to call you back with some critical lab results. Or maybe you can recall a time when you thought you had nailed a job interview, but it took the prospective employer weeks to get back to you. Or, in today's world, it certainly can feel like an eternity to have to go without your cell phone for even one day, <laughs> or if it needs to be repaired or replaced. And as this historic and consequential presidential election year unfolds, it can be anxiety-provoking and stressful at times to have to wait until November to see how all of this will turn out. You may have heard me mention this before, but one of my favorite authors and spiritual teachers is the late Henry Nowen. And so this morning, I'd like to close with some of his words of wisdom about the spiritual practice of waiting from his best-selling book, The Wounded Healer. 
Reverend Dr. Nowen teaches us that one, to wait with openness and trust is an enormously radical attitude toward life. Two, it is choosing to hope that something is happening for us that is far beyond our own imaginings. Three, it is living with the conviction that God molds us in love, holds us in tenderness, and moves us away from the sources of our fear and anxiety. And lastly, the spiritual practice of waiting is giving up our control over our future and letting God define and lead and shape our lives. As we all move deeper into this year of developmental changes in the seasons of our own personal lives, and this chapter of significant transition within our congregation, and this time of profound consequence for our nation, may we do so grounded in faith, open to growth, and nurtured and sustained through the gift of community, that each one of us would flourish and thrive with hope for today and for tomorrow. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>